Welcome back again. We now start the first session of the Technical Forum Virtual in 2021. A big hand in advance to Dieter and Thomas. And now I hand over. It's your turn. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, dear World Money Fair Technical Forum supporters, a very warm welcome to the first virtual session of the 17th Technical Forum. We are very pleased that you are joining us. Good morning, bonjour, buongiorno, ni hao, ohayo gozaimasu. Dieter and I would have loved to see you on the World Money Fair on the stage, but we also appreciate to have the possibility to uh, be on a virtual mode to communicate with yourself and have the 17th Technical Forum um, with you together. The World Money Fair website shows about 400 auditors from 50 countries of all continents have registered among which are 170 mints and national authorities. As we will go live with the session one twice today, we will probably see the actual number of participants at the end of the first event. Both for us, the organizers and moderators, as well for the presenters, this virtual stage is a new challenge and experience. However, the virtual stage offers us also the chance to establish new contents, contacts, which we are happy to take. For the first session um, today, we have four presentations. Three of those four presentations are new. Newcomers on the World Money Fair and definitely on the presentation stage. Um, please also <coughs> acknowledge that the preparation of those presentations take time, uh, need to be double done, need to be relooked. And we all um, are very thankful that the four presenters uh, have taken the opportunity, even though they had limited time, to prepare their presentations and to be ready for today's presentations. After the paper of the company's co-institute, Platit, GF Machine Solutions and Spalek, we will have uh, live Q&A sessions and you will see the chat function at the bottom of your live stream. You are invited at any time to use this chat function in order to address your questions to the presenters. We will collect the questions and carry out the Q&A session in a live discussion with the speakers at the end of the four presentations. The first presentation carried out by Christoph Frenz from Coinstitute um, is the start of the first session. Christoph is calling himself a metal former and has collected quite some experience in the mint industry on the circulation coin side as well on the precious metal coin side. He's done some mileage for this presentation and let's all together see um, what mileage um, he has done and whom he has been talking to. And when we talk about coins, the key issues attractivity security and public perception are of major importance. The question if coins with a high relief can also be produced at an attractive cost level will hopefully be answered by Christoph in his paper and we look very much forward to this. Welcome to the Technical Forum. Today we would like to talk about some R&D results which we have done in the past to measure the relief of a coin. Before starting, I would like to stress some words on the future of cash. Yes, there is a future for cash. And we have asked experts about their opinion. My opinion is we will still have cash in 20, in 50 years, but of course uh, it has not the same importance anymore than uh, it has now. 
but we still will have cash. We will not, we will not go away that, that cost. Cash is fast, anonymous and safe. If you look around the world, there are nice coins in Europe, in Africa, as well as in Asia, in Australia, and of course in North America and South America. If you look at a coin, what makes the attractiveness of a coin? To find out, we today went to Switzerland in Bern. Bern in Switzerland stands for quality. Let us see what the director of the Mint from here says about attractive coins. If you have a good design, if, if you can uh, uh, give the people emotion and then you have sharp edges and you really can see every detail, then the uh, coin is very attractive. This is Markus Flöth. Markus is the head of the Coin National Analysis Center of the German Central Bank, Deutsche Bundesbank. Hi, Hello, Markus. Hello, Christoph. Nice meeting you. Markus, we had a common research project on the relief of a coin. Why is the relief of a coin so important? If you like to have a coin, which will be accepted by the public, which will be perfectly matching all vending machines. You need a really tough specification. You need a good visible relief. And this relief is dependent on sharp ankles, on sharp corners. If you have a flat relief which is rounded, you can't see it really. Public is not able to detect the counterfeit, so this sharp relief and this edge, which is really important to have the thickness, the diameter of the coin, is one of the main factors of a perfect coin. Okay, so if you, um, if you can put it together, what makes the difference between a good relief and a counterfeited relief? At least 20 tons of pressure <laughs> as many process. If you compare the edge, if you compare the relief, the old one will stay much longer in circulation than the new. So, minting coins in a, in a good quality with a high relief means that it can stay longer in circulation. For decades longer. For decades longer. Okay. Now we have heard experts and their opinion about attractive coins. If we put this together, a good design makes an attractive coin, but only a distinct relief makes a coin valuable and difficult to counterfeit. Especially the high relief is helping us to, to be better than a producer of false coins. Let's come to the next chapter and the question how to measure a relief. Since 4,000 years, there are coins. And since 4,000 years, we don't know how to measure the relief. But this now is history. But how to measure the relief? Shall we come from bottom up? Or shall we come from the top to the lower? We have decided to come from the top to the lower. We have taken the edge in the edge, we have one layer, and from this layer, we go down micrometer by micrometer, that we can distinguish whether we have a good minted coin or whether we have an unfit coin. The left one has to be taken out of circulation? We do. Yes, you will, you will sort them out? We will sort them out yeah. uh, because of many other things. <laughs> Which one of those two is more economical? In the end, the right one, because it will last longer in circulation. 
which I will be much more safer against counterfeiting. Yeah, it's coin. Thank you, Markus, Good. for the insights, and we look forward to our next research project. Good. We can measure the relief, we can distinguish the relief, and we also can say whether a coin is original, counterfeited, or unfit. We have developed histograms, and the histograms can show this is a genuine coin, whereas another one is either unfit or, in this case, without plateaus in between. This is the counterfeited coin, although the coin itself looks good. So we have seen we can not only measure a relief, we also can say whether a coin is counterfeited or unfit or genuine. So the relief of a coin can be measured. You can generate objective data about the quality of the coin and you can put those data to specifications. So if you want to have an attractive coin and you buy it from another mint, you can objectively say whether the coin is good or not. Besides this, you can have new security features, which can be inspected by 3D optoelectronic measurement. But this will be the topic of next year's technical forum. And now you will think, high relief, sharp edges, your dial eye will go down. We had mints, partnering mints, and they made tests. And they could improve the processes, they could improve the coin design, the flanks, the radius, and at the end they had sharper edges and higher reliefs with a high die life. Let's hear what Marius Haldemann, the director from Swiss Mint, says about their findings for the die life. By producing this technology, producing coins on this quality level, I'm pretty sure your die life will be low. You have very good die life, for instance, the five drop here, even though we also have a high relief on all the smallest coins, uh, we are producing one, one million up to 1.5 million with one pair of dies. Okay, okay. wow. Well, from my point of view, definitely, because when you have sharp ed edges, it's also design is is pushing up and so it's more it's clear it's straight lines and so it's it's more uh it, it's definitely more attractive than when you just have rounded corners and so this looks not so nice I would say. thank you very much marius now we have heard marius heidemann marius heidemann said you can produce attractive coins with high relief leaf with sharp edges and still you have a high die life. High die life, but how to make this? If you are looking at the production of a coin from casting to packing, then there are three important things. That's the blank, it's the die, and it's the process of knitting. A high die life and a high relief is possible. We are looking forward to seeing you at the next technical forum in 2022. And seeing you in between would be even nicer. Thank you for your attention. Bye. Christoph. On behalf of the audience, I need to do this. This is typically the behavior of the audience after somebody has done all the preparation and has taken the effort. Um, thank you, Marius. Thank you, Marcos, for being part of this presentation. And it seems that um, you, when you talk about attractiveness, at the same time, you're also involving the security and trying to make coins not only as attractive, but secure as well. We've heard um, 
partially comments from Marius Haldimann about the productivity and I'm sure later on there might be question about the, the cost ratings and the cost level of how to produce attractive coins with a high relief. This is the reminder also for the audience to be part of the uh, chat community and to start communicating, raising um, questions which we will then later answer and forward to Christoph directly live in the Q&A session. Thank you, Thomas. A few sentences before we introduce the uh, next presentation of, of Blooded. Um, you all know that uh, the statements worldwide are located in the big cities or even in the capitals of their countries. In order to make the lifetime of the coining dice economical, hard chroming equipment was used exclusively over many years and we all know that for environmental aspects hard chroming is not the best solution. For the first time at the technical forum the company Platit presents with the SM Pools line a new state-of-the-art in-house PVD coating system for coining dies. Dr. Yuri Wehrs will introduce us to this technology and submit solutions for the production of coining dies. Yuri, the virtual stage is yours. Hello and welcome to the first session of the Technical Forum of the World Money Fair 2021. My name is Juri Wehrs, I'm with Platit Switzerland and today it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the Platit SM Pulse, our brand new state-of-the-art in-house PVD coding system dedicated to coin stamps. And before I'm actually going to show you the Platit SM Pulse, let's consider what is important when we speak about PVD coatings on coin stamps. Well, if you look at a coin stamp, the first thing that really strikes is the tremendous surface quality. You have mirror polished areas with roughnesses in the order of a few hundred nanometers. And within the same stamp, we see micro patterned areas where we have roughnesses in the order of several thousand, yes, even up to several ten thousands of nanometers. That's more than one order of magnitude difference in surface roughness. And with the Platite as impulse, we are able to perfectly replicate and copy this surface with a two and a half micrometer thin chromium nitride layer. But the coin stamp is not only a pretty surface. Ultimately, the coin stamp is a tool and the tool needs to perform well. Hence, we can assure you that the PVD coatings from the Platit as impulse have the perfect adhesion to your coin stamp surface as well as maximum durability within your stamping application. And in fact, PVD coatings are environmentally friendly as they work without any harmful substances and chemicals. So you do not have to worry about hexavalent chromium when you think about PVD coatings. But let me show you the SM Pulse now. The SM Pulse is our new custom design coating solution for coin stamps. It produces high quality sputter coatings and we have multiple coatings available for you. Chromium nitride, Titanium diboride is a purely ceramic coating, carbon-based coatings, and of course we develop specific coatings upon customer request. All coatings are free of hexavalent chromium. You can coat high volumes in this unit. It is capable of coating up to 18 punches within a single batch, which guarantees you a very good productivity. It's easy to use, and when we designed the machine, we paid special attention to its modularity because maybe you sit in a modern facility where you have big gates where even trucks can drive in and out, then it's no problem. However, if you sit in an old, historically significant facility where you have narrow hallways and small staircases, you will also be able to fit this machine in there. You may think now, wow, that sounds really good. And I know exactly how I'm going to integrate this machine in my existing uh, periphery. Well, that's great for us. We only sell you the machine as a standalone unit and we are happy. However, if you say, wow, this sounds really interesting, but I have absolutely no clue what else I'm going to need to do PVD coating in-house. Well, 
that's where the Petit turnkey system as a concept comes in. As we can supply the PVD coding unit as the centerpiece of the turnkey system. However, we can also supply the right decoding equipment, cleaning equipment, quality control, as well as all the necessary PVD accessories to get you up and running within a very short time. We take care of your entire process and we do this since more than 25 years. I mentioned earlier that the S-Impulse is easy to handle and well, in fact, it really is. I'm going to show you this by the example of how you load coin stamps into the chamber. When you open the vacuum chamber, the first and basically the only thing you see is the centrally mounted sample holding disk. We have standard holders with predefined hole diameters, but of course we also manufacture specific holders upon your request. You take your cleaned coin stamp and insert it into the sample holder as it's depicted on the picture on the lower right. You can load stamps with different diameters within one batch. That's absolutely no problem. The only thing you need to take care about is that the level of the area you want to code is approximately the same for all your stamps. So if you have a very large or long stamp, you may want to put a spacer ring above. Don't worry, we also supply you with these. Then you're basically finished with loading your tools. All what's left to do now is close the vacuum chamber and press the start button. And how one of the recipe works, I'm going to show you by the example of a chromium nitride. And I'm not going through the details of every recipe step. I'm going to break it down for you into four simple basic steps. Step number one is pumping and heating. The chamber is evacuated and heated up to a temperature of approximately 200 to 240 degrees Celsius. This temperature is feasible for the majority of steel grains that are used for coin stamps. However, if you use different steels or have different temperature requirements, talk to us. We can take care of that. The pumping and heating step takes approximately 60 minutes, which is then followed by a very important step, the so-called plasma cleaning. After engrazing your coin stamp, cleaning it, and then loading it into the vacuum chamber, a very thin native oxide layer has formed on the surface. In order to ensure that we have the perfect bonding between the nitride coating and your coin stamp, we need to remove this oxide layer. This happens in a very gentle but effective etching process, which takes approximately 35 minutes. And then you're good to coat your specimen. The coating step takes only 40 minutes. In less than 40 minutes, you're coating 2.5 micrometers of chromium nitride. For a PVD process, this is really, really fast. And now your coin stamps are basically finished. All what's left now is to cool back down to ambient temperatures, open the vacuum chamber, and take out your perfectly coated coin stamps. The whole batch time, door to door, takes less than four hours. This means that within four, in one day, you can code up to four to six batches. This is really good productivity, considering that you can load up to 18 punches in one single batch. Or in other words, after four hours, you have your perfectly coated stamp in hand ready for production. Time is actually money here. And since I cannot stress the surface quality enough, let me show an example of how good the surface qualities of coatings from the s impulse are. Here in the back, you see a steel plate which has received three different surface treatments. On the very left, we have a finely sanded surface with emery paper. In the middle, we have an electro erosion textured surface and on the far right, you see a surface which has been mirror finished with diamond paste. We use the confocal microscope to measure the surface roughness in a relatively large area, 250 by 250 micrometers, on every of those segments. Then we took the steel plate, put it in the S impulse, and coated it with 2.5 micrometers of chromium nitride. And then, after the coating was finished, we took the plate out and measured again. And what you can see here is that you have literally no difference from before the coating to after coating, meaning that we form the perfect copy of your surface without disturbing it, without harming it, without any distortion. And with this, with this I'm already at the end of my presentation. I introduced to you the Platite as Impulse, our new custom-designed coding solution for coin stamps, which is easy to use, 
fast, provides really excellent surface quality, and the PVD coatings are environmentally friendly and sustainable. You can buy the S-Impulse as a standalone unit, or if you want, as an entire turnkey system, complete with cleaning solutions, decoating solutions, as well as quality control. And with this, I would like to thank you for your time, and I hope to answer all your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you and have a great day. Bye-bye. Yuri, thank you very much for your contribution. Now we all know more about the in-house PVD coating process and we are curious about the questions from the audience in the later Q&A session after the fourth paper. And for this, Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, we really need your active support. Uh, we have right now 105 par participants online um, watching this uh, uh, session of the first technical forum. 105 people, this is an amazing number for us. And we need your active uh, participation in a way that you use the chat function below the live stream. You will find that and you can ask the questions for the later discussions after the fourth presentation. So please use the chat function, ask the questions right away after the, or during the presentation, that we, we collect the questions and we will have them available after the fourth presentation for a discussion with all the presenters live. Thank you. Thomas. Thanks, Dieter. Um, raise your questions, write them down. Don't be shy, be active in this uh, first virtual technical forum. We will stay within the tool section. Uh, we will talk about laser. And interestingly, I think we have had innovative laser technology as a headline since many years. But it's interesting how far laser technology can go. And I think in most of the cases when we talk about innovative laser technology, it is about the precision. I'm not sure whether laser technology has been landing on Mars now and whether it's been used there, but with the preciseness I think uh, we are going always a step ahead. GF, GF Machining Solutions, um, in, this day, in this case presented by Benjamin and Fred. Benjamin has uh, collected almost three decades of experience. Sorry, Benjamin, you are not old. And uh, Fred is the head of the marketing. Both of them has, have been preparing a presentation and are ready now to explain us the details of their innovation at a micron level. Good morning, my name is Benjamin Paganelli. I am Head of Sales Advanced Manufacturing Region Europe and South America. Due to COVID-19 restriction, I will wear my mask and let uh, Fred introduce himself. Hello, I am Fred Goudard. I'm Product Manager Marketing uh, for the Laser Technology. And uh, today we are going to spend a couple of minutes to speak about the new solution from the group uh, George Fisher, the Laser P400 GF Femto Flexipulse. First of all, let's talk about GF. Uh, GF is a worldwide group uh, installed all over the world. We are present in the industrial machine tool manufacturing, and we are providing solution in several segments of application. Can be aeronautic, can be ICT, can be, uh, I mean, mold making. We are present all over the world, and we have a network of support uh, huge. So let's start to speak about what we are doing with this machine. So Benjamin, let's show us the type of parts that we are able to achieve with this solution with the laser P400 GF M2 Flexipulse. Okay, Fred, thank you for your introduction. So let's start from our first example. Our first example, it's a laser engraving, a 3D engraving on uh, steel. Uh, this still gives us the possibility to explain and to share with you the great details reproduction we can achieve with our technology. And we will come back to the explanation afterwards. And especially how many kind of surface finishing we can achieve with our technology. So this is a still K390. What, what, so, what are the challenges with this type of, um, I mean, uh, machining? 
The challenge is to repeat uh, a, tr a 3D details file. So the mm -hmm. first topic is how to achieve a great detailed reproduction of the material. And the second is the hardness of the material for sure, because yeah. not all laser are able or allow to engrave such kind of material easily. You mean that uh, in our solution, we're able to either machine hard metal as fragile metal? Correct, correct. So we will uh, share with all of you an example about fragile material, but the second example to come back to the, I will say, the hardness of the material is to share with you the same file with the same hardware, so the same laser machine on carbide. This example explains a little bit our flexibility to manage different material and achieve absolutely great results in terms of details and especially surface finishing. And here, huh? here again, it's with the same unique hardware. machine. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Same hardware and uh, we have some um, uh, features which permit to switch from hard metal to um, steel, or now we are going to, to see with a fragile. Fragile material, yes. Yeah. Uh, just as we could not be present with all of you in Berlin, we can only share example and not our machine. So this example is just to uh, highlight also our capability to engrave different and exotic material. So this is to open your ideas or your variety of material you could achieve with our machine. And is a perfect example on how our femto green laser could achieve result without cracking the material. Yeah, because I understood that um, um, machining this type of material, uh, you need to have a particular beam which is not going to destroy the material. Huh? Correct. correct. Uh, to avoid to have, uh, I mean, remelted uh, surfaces or to have uh, some, uh, I mean, uh, crack on the edge of the data. Huh? Correct, correct. So these open possibilities to engrave exotic material, like for example, diamond, plastics, or yeah. other material, glass. So we allow you really to open new possibilities with our machine. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about our machine. If we, we come back to the solution that we are providing, yeah. it's a machine um, unique, yeah. equipped with two different um, wavelengths, but uh, easily op uh, with an easy operation. Correct. Yeah. Our machine is a P400U. We introduced this machine on the market in 2015. We started with five axis capabilities machine into the industrial business. And recently we improved the machine by following the market request of our customer. We introduced with our new laser solution with the possibility to manage two different wavelengths. We will come back later to this example. Now I want to explain to our guest why GF is different in terms of machine. So the first, I will say, uh, example to share with our customers is to explain that GF started laser business in 2010 with what we call the laser texturing five axis machining. So to explain uh, this example, uh, I have also here the possibility to have a machine, but we will share an example. This is a typical example of a five-axis laser texturing uh, application. And here we can see that uh, the, the texture applied is uh, geometrical. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, means that uh, we are able to, 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 to reproduce geometrical or artistical Great. details. Exactly. During the software explanation, uh, it will be more easy to understand for you why we use different ways to use the 3D file for the meat industry. The second application we are recognized on the market is to realize laser blasting or laser frosting on five axis. Also here, you can see that absolutely this shape is not easy uh, to be lasering, also to be milled, to be honest. So you can see our capabilities to laser blasting or to laser frosting apart. And uh, when we are able to do that on a five axis part, we are able to do that. I would say it's an easy game for us to yeah. do it in three axes. Okay. The last and the important information I would like to explain to our guest is our five axis engraving capability. So you can see it's not easy maybe because it's more easy to do it live with you in Berlin, but you have a five axis engraving example. So we are able with a 3D file to apply laser texturing, frosting, engraving, and um, some also other effect. A quite complex solution. Absolutely. 
About the machine itself, we talk about a five axis. We talk about the possibility to engrave different uh, capabilities on our machine. It's important to remain and to remember that we are introducing also some hardware to help our job. The first hardware is to integrate uh, an automatic vision system. So this is especially on the mint industry is really well used to engrave also to blast or to frost after milling or other processes. The second is to use a 3D touch probe to, to adjust the part in the machine itself. So this is our, is our standard since mm. many years, also not only for the legs there. And at least, uh, and I take this example, Fred, I think we can easily explain, is how to integrate a job into our machine because we will come back to the explanation on the software side. The software is offline, mm. so you should prepare your job before. Then when the file is ready, you go to the machine and you do the job. How to make sure that we are in the good position in the machine itself? It's all the system that you have uh, told us before, exactly. the optical vision system, the probe, the probe. which permit to automatically uh, localize the part inside the, the working volume. area. Perfect. So in the machine, you fi can find a chuck like this one. System 3R is part of our group. With each chuck, you can easily come back to the position inside the machine and be ready to job and to engrave. Cool, cool. And um, we have some solution of automation if we are producing a large amount of parts. Yes, huh? absolutely. Automation, the machine is ready to automate, to, be, to receive automation. We have different solutions also here. Huh? Fred, yeah. we can use and move pallets yes. to be integrated in the truck. Yeah. Or recently, we also move really deeper in the past production world. Past production means we have a pick and place system uh, who allow us to put the part on the machine. And so here, the, the, the really the tremendous uh, advantage is the fact that with uh, pick and place, we can work on a different population of parts on the same batch of production. Can Correct. be different diameter, different uh, morphology of the parts. So it means we have a complete solution for a, a full uh, automated process. Correct. And just to highlight also why I talk about the vision system. Mm. If you, we talk about past production, the touch, 3D touch probe sometimes is not, I would say, the best tool to adjust the position of the job compared to the position of the part. Mm. So the vision system is absolutely unique to introduce the position of the small part into our machine. So thank you for all these details. And if we speak about the machine, and to, uh, we were talking about the wavelengths. Wavelengths uh, provide us um, in fact, different type of beam size. Correct. So before to, uh, to go deeper on the, on the laser itself, just come back to a short explanation about the software. And it's important to explain to our guest. So you should remember that you could uh, import in our machine different files. Thanks to the partnership with Carveco, today we allow ourselves to receive also files dedicated to the mint industry. So what then we should apply and how we work. An easy way, I will say, we have two possibilities. We can take the 3D file and move directly to our software called LaserCam. LaserCam allows us to bring some details from the 3D file and work on three axes directly on the coin. Mm -hmm. The second, and this is something new for the yeah, Mint, yeah. is to switch and to, uh, I will say, uh, change the, the details image from a 3D file to a bitmap. This is auto automatically done by our software. It's done since many years as we started in this business. And the, the, the operation makes the job easily and make more, I would say, uh, simple the operation to apply this file into a 3D shape. So um, I could not, and we could not go details now, but mm. we really ask our guests to contact us later on and we will go deeper on this explanation. And what, one thing that uh, you must keep in mind is that our solution of preparation of the job can be done on the desk, uh, far from the machine, and can be transferred to the machine and automatically uh, set up in the way to produce. Yes. Means our... you don't need to be in front of the machine to prepare the job. Absolutely, absolutely. Now we can go a little bit deeper to the laser sources, maybe. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so we were talking about the size of the beam. 
Yes. So it's something very important in a particular environment, environment because here we are working in the reproducibility of fine details. And uh, usually the size of a beam, it's about a couple of microns. Huh? Correct. Correct. The, the, I would say the wavelength, so we repeat, the laser allow us to use in the same laser sources two wavelengths. And the wavelengths identify the type of material and especially what we can do, which mm. kind of material we can work. So the infrared solution is working with a wavelength of approximately 1060 nanometer. The power of the laser is a femtolaser, it's 40 watt, so it's absolutely increasing compared to the past. Mm -hmm. And the green cut by two everything, means yeah. we cut the wavelength by two, so 560, uh, 550 nanometer. The power also, so we cut by two, 22 watts, so these allow us to be really efficient in a fragile material like sapphire, for example. And last point is the beam. The FMTO infrared have a beam approximately of 30 micron with a small focal length we have on the market. But with the green, you could achieve something between 10 to 15. Means so, that we have a tool about a couple of microns absolutely. in the way to reproduce the detail, which is amazing. Yeah? Amazing. amazing. Nice. So we thank you for your attention and we really wait your request and more than welcome to contact us directly. Thank you very much and have a nice end of day. Dear Benjamin, dear Fred, thank you very much. I really like your own enthusiasm about the technical aspects you were talking about, the different lasers being used, I'm, I'm saying carefully, at the same time or one after the other, the te technology you are offering. I think I've seen laser technology for a long, long time and I'm always surprised how much more detailed lasers can work and what kind of preciseness they are, they are offering. I am sure um, there will be a number of questions from people who do understand much more about the laser technology uh, than I do. So applause of, a round of applause for the preparation and the work you have done in the presentation um, you have established for us. This is also the right time to remember the audience that you can like the questions which are published and which are raised now so that they climb up in their um, importance and that they can be questioned or raised first. We have some questions from Europe so far. Um, Asia is a little bit shy and also nothing from Australia yet. So, uh, Australians, where are you? Dieter. Australians are down under, yeah. But let's, let's see whether we will find Prober, Prober later in the Q&A session, as he usually does in the, in the live sessions in, in Berlin. Now, when we talk uh, about the survey's finishing process, uh, dear friends and colleagues, not only the effective and uh, proof machines are the key of success. Uh, the success strategy is completed also by finishing media, which are used in the finishing process. Inge Lögen mm -hmm. carried out a study and we are happy that he will now present us the results of this study and all mints and blank manufacturers are surely curious about it. Ingo, the stage is yours. Hello. Today I would like to talk to you about the, the way how to strike a very good and very nice coin. I think one of the basic requirements to start with is to please the old desire to have the right blank ready for the striking process. This has been discussed many, many times and we need to do the finishing operation because from the previous processes like rolling and rimming there are marks on the surface and also oxides due to material corrosion, respectability, also some contamination can't be avoided. This is the role of the finishing process to create a bright metal surface, to have this clean metal structure to be ready to pre uh, pre 
provide the perfect coin after the striking process. We recently introduced a new type of material into the minting industry, which is a high-performance ceramic. We call that type CHD media. CHD media is also available in different shapes, for example, a 3 mm ball, but also in a more robust form, which is, for example, um, a roller, a cylinder, with a diameter of 5 mm and a length of 5 mm. We did an extensive trial program comparing the stainless steel golden standard finishing media with this new generation of finishing materials and compared them onto one blank type. Actually, it has been two blank types. Kindly, our friends from the Bull Mint have provided sterling silver and fine silver blanks, all from the same lot, all produced in the same way to have comparable results by applying the different medias to these batches of coin banks. The finishing trials have been done in our demonstration center, which I introduce now to you. So, all the trials have been performed in our technical demonstration center in our factory in Bocholt, and we used uh, of our, one of our centrifugal finishing machines called Z4. It has a, a, a working bowl volume of about 25 liters, and we used always the same parameters to uh, treat the different blanks from the different uh, um, trial setups. We always started with a small pickling step, then went into the polishing phase and finally applied rinsing to remove the residues from the compound before we separated the media from the blanks. The total process time was always 30 minutes. Afterwards, we dried them with a textile dryer and started to analyze the blank quality. So, here are the results of the surface measurement of the sterling silver. You see the different measurements depending on the different media mixtures, which are um, um, a result of the weight and also of the geometry of the media. <clears throat> For sure, more heavy media like satellites or the pins in combination with the uh, edges of these media are generating a more structured surface, which having a higher RZ value than smaller, lighter media like the balls, for example, stainless or ceramic. As mentioned, we want to eliminate the, especially the rolling marks, which are visible here on the photo and also on the microscope. And that can be generated very efficiently by the stainless steel satellites, which are removing the, the structure from the rolling marks and also are capable to hide little scratches from the surface. Finally, you create kind of an orange peel, which is also promoting the material flow during the striking process. A similar effect you can also create with a CHD media. Here we are using walls to again break the, the texture from the rolling <coughs> and generate a bright surface. Because we do not have the rim, the appearance of the blank having more brightness and more are more shiny because the, the balls are rolling on the surface instead of um, ripping of the, the oxides. After the sterling silver, we also analyzed the fine silver, which is a softer material. Here you see a similar order of different surface roughnesses, again, uh, as a function of the, the, the weight and the geometry to treat fine silver the raw material with satellites is a bit too rough, so typically you start with stainless steel balls, which here giving the desired result. To 
if you compare this to the CHD, the ceramic media, you, you um, get a similar surface roughness, but because the CHD balls are 20% lighter, it's so about 4 kilogram per liter instead of stainless steel, 5 kilogram per liter, you generate a, a, a bit brighter, more shinier surface. If you have more oxides on the surface or little scratches from the rimming process or other storage or transportation effects, sometimes you want to hide these and to want to create also as, uh, to promote the material flow from the, for the relief. You want to have a little bit more force of the CHD media. In order to do this, you can use the pins. The pins are having more, more weight and also having the edges, which are similar to the satellites. And this is generating kind of an orange peel, similar to the satellites, what we know from the past. But all of the results from the blanks are regardless. Finally, what, what we need to assess are the striking results out of that surface preparation. This is not, has not been done in our demonstration center, the here for that reason, we are flying to Bulgaria, to our friends from the Bull Mint. Thank, thank you again for Vladimir and Plummer and his team to supporting us with the striking trials. The striking has been done on a press with 180 tons press force, and it has been a four times stroke in order to form this lovely design from reverse and obverse side. So we had, then we had a close look to the results of the striking. First, we analyzed the sterling silver prepared by the satellites. Very good quality, proof, proof level. But when you go really into the uh, details, you see little dents created by that textured surface from the satellites. This can be avoided by using the CHD balls. Here we have the same clear, bright um, design and, and, and appearance of the coin with no defects. And on top, we also have no marks or visible textures in the table of the, of the metal. Going to the fine silver, here we, we did not use the satellites because of their, their aggressivity. We used the stainless steel balls in that example also achieved proof quality level in the striking process and a similar or comparable result with the CHD balls. But even in order, like I said earlier, when you have a bit more oxidized blanks or if you want to hide little scratches on the surface, you can even uh, increase the aggressivity of the, 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 the media mixture by adding the the pins, and that's the mixture of the pins and the balls. And here, you, even because you had more aggressive media, you can't find the same structure or leftovers from the satellites, uh, what you would likely see with stainless steel media. So striking, quite pleased uh, to, to see these results, but what about chemical behavior? Here we have to look into the different compositions of the, of the different medias used in the minting industry. We, to compare these, we exposed three different types to a strong, very strong pickling acid, which is not, not quite common, but, also, uh, but still used in the industry just to demonstrate the, the resistance against strong pickling agents. The first material we applied that acid was um, a stainless steel grid with a lower quality, just 316, which is not common, but still some people use it. And um, with the results, what we see here, that the, the strong acid is terribly attacking the, the surface and is basically destroying the material after a very, very short period of time. A higher 
chemical resistance has a 316L, which is more the standard in the industry since many, many years. But even there, you see that the, the strong pickling agent having an effect on the surface, it is forming the bright, shiny surface into a dull uh, texture. And that uh, is reflecting that particles and ions and that metal has been solved from the surface of that material type. You can't see any evidence of chemical attack on the CHD media material, which is not a big surprise because from a chemical point of view, ceramics are in general very chemical inert. So, as a conclusion, I have to say Nile is right. Thank you, Ingo. To summarize, the new CHD media family is offering various shapes and geometries. You can mix that media in different relations. The result is a homogeneous texture of the surface in combination with strong and chemical resistance, finally leading into excellent striking results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ingo, for your presentation. This paper clearly shows that this testing period and all good efforts are leading to a perfect surfaces. And as supposed before, it was clear that Nele, that Nele was right. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, we have 110 people online and we look very much forward now to the questions in the now following Q&A session. If not done already, you, dear auditors, now have the possibility to pose your questions via the chat function just below your live stream. Thomas? Thanks, presenters. This is the right time now to involve the presenters and the owner of the presentations carrying also the knowledge. Um, so we will have them now live. Unfortunately, we don't <coughs> have them with us, but we will be able to raise all the questions and have most probably very professional answers from them directly. Dieter, would you start with the first question? Yes, uh, pleasure. I just uh, click it on and uh, it is for Yuri, for, uh, for Bloody, the first questions. Um, the question reflects, of course, your, um, the option of, of the, the decoding system and how does the decoding system work? Is this decoding system environmental friendly as your uh, PVD uh, <coughs> system, Yuri? Well, first of all, thank you for the numerous questions which i can see here i'm really surprised can't hear you. so many questions now um in fact when you decode yuri and we can't hear you you can't hear me that's not good so other guys in the session can hear me my microphone is switched on i can hear you i, I can hear you benjamin okay okay Ah, now it's working, right? It's working now? Good. Yes, okay. yes, sorry. Okay, so again, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, well, in the decoding process, uh, you, at least if you're dealing with chromium-based coatings, you're, of course, not free of uh, processes that produce hexavalent chromium. However, if you do a, a chemical decoding, you have to keep in mind that the amount of chemicals and the amount of coating in terms of volume you're dealing with is really really small in comparison to when you have a chemical plating process meaning that you're producing chromium-6 in the decoding but not much in terms of volume the baths are small um, the baths are covered um, we take care that you're not getting in contact with any of the chemicals. Um, and this is the most we can do to protect you. Thanks. Uh, and, it's, yeah, and it's, of course, always a chemical process. It's not a plasma process for the coating. So a clear chemical process. And of course, uh, you have to take care of uh, the uh, all the, the by byproducts or all the the, uh, pro, uh, the process itself in, in a special way and uh, of course thanks for <coughs> answering this question Yuri Thomas would yeah. you Yuri there's another question for you but to get also the other people being uh, warmed up I raise the next next question to uh, um, Benjamin 
Uh, that's uh, um, a question which is uh, raised from Alexander. Alexander from Axis, you may know him quite well. Any experience of five axis engraving will negatively influence high force embossing because of undercuts? That's an absolutely good question. So um, uh, we try to explain our software process. So since we started with this technology in uh, 2010, we were asked by our customer to laser texture or laser engrave 3D shapes. So in order to avoid undercuts and to avoid any mistake in terms of embossing or injection or uh, blow molding uh, application, we can, with our file, decrease the level of pixels, so the resolution on the border of the molds to ensure a proper uh, process during the injection or the embossing. So I would say, by a softer point of view, we manage the decrease of the resolution on the border. So we are not affected by any undercut situation. Thank you, ben Benjamin. Unfortunately, now we are not operating on a mic, so Alexander has not been able to react immediately, but I'm sure this will have uh, at least highlighted the solution available to him and also to your customers. Yes, Peter? thank you. Again, for you, Yuri, the question uh, for Platit, how can Platit <coughs> apply co-sputtering uh, or multi-layer sputtering with their S-Impulse system? So, when we developed the SM Pulse system, we paid most attention of simplicity of the system. And in this case, it means that we also have only one target in the machine. So if you want to do multi-layer sputtering, you can, of course, always think about doing a nitride, uh, not nitride, multi-layer. This is one option you have. And of course, there are not only targets which consist out of one metal, but also composite targets where you can have different alloys. So this is an option, but we have only one target in the chamber. So you are, you cannot mix individual elements as it just comes to your mind. Thank you, Yuri, for the clear reply. Thomas, will you take the next one? Yes, I will. I'm actually not sure whether I have deleted one question because I wanted the one which was answered to delete from, from uh, Benjamin. So if you have followed that I have deleted a question which was not raised, please just uh, put it again onto the screen, ask it again. So we are making sure that uh, there's nothing left out. So I have not done that on purpose. Um, I will raise the next one that's... Uh, there's another one for Benjamin, we will raise that soon, but I'm now talking to Christoph from Robert Newman for Coinstitute. When you look at high reliefs with straight edges, do you see that more complex relief designs <coughs> are possible with high relief over low reliefs? Yes, absolutely. I like the question because in the past years, the relief quality... We can Christoph nicht hören. Yes, I ah, can now. hear you well. Perfect, Christoph, yeah. now. Oh, okay. So thank you for the question. Um, I like the question because, um, yes, it is possible to have two different levels of um, relief. Um, the system that we have developed even allows to do more different levels of, um, of reliefs in the coin so that there is a more plastical, that there is a more free dimension um, experience deep on the coin. How to do this? That would be an extra, uh, an extra session. Thank you, Christoph. It sounds like you are having another presentation very soon. Dieter, are you raising the next question? Hey, yes, uh, for GF Machine Solutions, uh, uh, the, another question from, uh, from, from a laser expert. Um, for TF, the cycle time seemed quite high for uh, Femto. Uh, what slice thickness did you use for the engraving on the Femto red laser? Benjamin? Um, so the examples we shown were done with our, uh, our files. So we <laughs> tried to get the best profit on that. You should uh, remember that our targets to realize such a test was first of all to achieve the best surface quality, I mean in terms of array, and to copy as much as possible fine details. So the target was not uh, to, uh, I would say, to improve the cycle time. 
By the way, we achieve uh, 0.2 RA on the surface. And in terms of uh, speed, I could not share the details in terms of parameter, but for sure the improvement could be really huge uh, as we are talking about a 40 watt femto laser system. So the time could be for sure improved, but will be a, a compromise between the quality and the details we could achieve. Thanks, Benjamin. Welcome. Thomas, would you take the next one? Yes, Ingo, warm up for you. I know this is not uh, straight to the way they occurred here, but Ingo, to get a warm up for yourself. Ingo, what do you suggest according to your study? What kind of shape material for unregular shape blanks? And that question is raised from Simovit, which, which means Poland is also part of the um, virtual technical forum today. Hello, Simovit. Thanks, Ingo, yeah. for answering, taking this question. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Simovit, for the question. Um, in order to reach um, corners and edges of irregular shaped blanks, we uh, are about to launch a different shape, a, a, a further shape, which is a, a ceramic satellite, which has exactly the same geometry like the um, CH, uh, SHD satellites five by seven millimeter, which uh, you may can see here in the in my camera. So this is the next product we were launching, especially to reach difficult areas to clean them from oxides and any contaminations. Thank you, Ingo. Thank you very much. Um, this was a clear answer as a yes uh, can be used in the future. Ceramic is the way to go. Dieter, are you going? I'm the going next to the next one. And as you're messing up uh, the number of questions, the direction of the number of questions, I just uh, have noticed that uh, Canada is online uh, as well. And that's an early morning for uh, for Shen Yao. Uh, but we will uh, come back to his question, of course, at a later date uh, when we when we uh, when we go in the direction we follow with the GF machine solutions, because this question also have been very much liked. Um, uh, are there are the shown samples produced with the green laser? Uh, is this one of the reasons why the processed took, process took too, so long? Uh, no. So the test we did on the carbide and on the steel, 290, were achieved with the infrared system. Uh, the one we used with the green was for the sapphire and the, uh, the time for sure is a, a little bit not also here, the topic and the target from the customer request. On Sapphire, we, we, we achieve a result without micro cracks. So the only one we show on our presentation was on the Sapphire with the green laser wavelengths. So just with the infrared. Great, and if we just stay on, on you, Benjamin, uh, uh, sorry for keeping you so busy. What is the benefit of the five axis lasering in coin design? But, um, this uh, I could not answer a specific case because uh, for sure our te the laser tool had some tolerance so in Z axis. The tolerance we normally use in our system is 200 microns. So means if the surface is not flat and you have a shape between the Z axis, to jump between the maximum Z and the minimum Z, and it's, uh, the, the, the ratio is more than 200 micron, for sure to apply a, a bitmap file into a 3D shape, we could focus and we could uh, follow the shape with a, a re less resolution of 200 micron. So the target is for sure to follow the shape with our, soft, our file. Perfect. Thanks, Benjamin. Thomas, would you take the next question? We please? have another one for Platit from Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous. You discussed a plasma etching stage during the PVD process. What is your pre-cleaning process to remove polishing compounds prior to the PVD coating? Yeah, thank you for the question. So we supply different cleaning solutions, um, but basically all of them work very similar. You have uh, multiple bars, either within one closed system or several open systems and you have an ultrasound and washing chemical based solution here in both cases. Um, for the closed system, which is particularly nice, um, you have the advantage that you also have a corrosion inhibitor and drying process within the same cleaning process, meaning that when the washing cycle is finished, your coin stems get perfectly dried 
you can store them in there or take them out, um, then they're ready for code. Okay, so Yuri, you are saying that that process is typically done as a pre-process outside the PVD coating machine. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Dieter? Uh, we have one more on the way for TF Machine Solutions. Do you really use grayscale images for deep engraving? How does the limit of 256 gray cycle colors affect your engraving accuracy? Another Absolutely a good question. So it seems we, we, we are able to explain uh, our, our software. So in general, there need no any limit of resolution of the grayscale. The way to obtain a grayscale are different, but for sure one of the, the, the possibility is to get a 3D file and then to convert to an image. So what is important is that no limitation of resolution of grayscale, but the minimum target is to achieve a 10 micron by pixel. So this is really the value we would like to, to recommend to our customer. So the minimum resolution by pixel should be something around 10 micron. Thanks, Benjamin. Anonymous again. Ingo, this is one for you. Is the CHD media also considered for base metals, for example, for circulation coins? Absolutely, yes, uh, it is. Uh, in com the combination of the strong chemical resistance, what we show in the in the study, is um, suggesting, especially the use it there, because there, there are typically more oxides present to be uh, need to be removed by chemical energy from the strong pickling, but um, because of you also want to increase the um, the mechanical force, we may choose then not only the balls. We go to some something with more corners, which are the pins or the the satellites I just showed. So definitely, it is uh, an, um, an option for um, circulation material as well. Thanks, Ingo. Ingo, while we have you online, the, another question for you. Ceramic is known to be bridal. Uh, how are you seeing cracked, damaged, damaged media? Ceramic media is also available in satellite shape is the other part of the question. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Dieter. Uh, like, like I said um, uh, in the earlier question to Simowitz, yes, it, there are different shapes, especially the satellites coming on board. Now we have the pins, the balls in different uh, diameters to find the right um, geometry to, to go into the area you want you want to finish. With regards to the, the brittleness or the, the, the toughness of the material, this was um, one of the, the, the key issues in the beginning to fight the right formulation between the chemical resistance, the, the toughness, um, the, the mechanical strengths and, and the mechanical strengths. Um, so the, uh, the material is capable to handle the pressure in centrifugal finishing machines, especially in combination with high loads of coin blanks. So not only in the, in the small ones for, um, for precious metal treatment, also for the, the larger ones, which are considered for circulation. And in order to maintain this, the production step of all the um, ceramic media having um, um, a validation step where the media will be applied to the pressure being present in the in the process and uh, only if they pass that pressure test they will go into the production thanks uh, ingo for this uh, very uh, nice reply and good reply answering all the questions we had before in that uh, round thomas will you take the next one for yeah. platit yes for platit this comes from xinyao li that's, that's Canada. So, Xinyao, if you really have been watching this presentation, you have been starting to be awake from four o'clock this morning. Congratulations. That is uh, definitely a very tough one to do. Thanks, Xinyao. Question is raised from Xinyao, Royal Canadian Mint. For Platit, for Yuri, have you tried a coat DLC coating for coining dies, circulation coin dies, or precious metal coin dies? Uh, the answer is yes and no. We have tried those coatings but not in the SM Pulse yet. The thing is that the SM Pulse is capable of doing these coatings, but we are currently developing those recipes for the downscale of this machine as we have a different chamber size here. But yes, we, we know how to handle those processes. We know how they work and we can break this down to the SM Pulse unit. So give us a few more weeks, then this is done. We are working. 
okay. really hard at the moment on this machine. <laughs> Yuri, then I'm raising immediately the next one because it's also from, from Xinyao. Again, what is the temperature during <coughs> the coating for the chrome nickel? Do you see heater in addition to, coat, uh, to coating reaction? So the coating temperature as such is approximately 180 degrees C. We are heating up the chamber before to 200 to 240 degrees C, and then we cool it down. This is just um, a disassistance gas and procedure. And uh, yes, approximately 180 degrees Celsius it is. Um, we are using the heater in addition. Uh, the chamber is temperature controlled, so the heater is driven by a PID controller, and we keep the same temperature throughout the entire process. This also adds to the stability of the process once your substrate is heated through. Thanks, Yuri, for this answer. Thanks, Xin Yao, for raising the questions uh, at the time and with, you. uh, with, with your interest. Dieter, will you take the next one? Yeah, and uh, then more questions for Yuri, but we give you uh, a little break. And uh, I have one for Spalik, uh, uh, Ingo, keeping you busy as well. How does the CHD balls or also pins handle edge rimmed blanks? Yeah, because of the, the, the balls, <coughs> um, there you are need to have the right diameter. So um, if the, the the rim edge has about one millimeter in, uh, in radius, you will need a two millimeter ball, which is available. And especially what we know from the stainless steel media, the, the satellite geometry, the ball cone, uh, which where the rim is nibbling into that area, that's something what we also, the geometry we also want to use with a CHD media, What I just uh, showed, I can do it again. Hopefully you can, can see the geometry. So this is basically the same bulk material from what we, done, what, what we have done in the study, but has the same shape what we are using in the um, coin blank finishing industry based on stainless steel as a golden standard was I just, just described. Thanks, Ingo. You have been very well prepared for all the questions. Uh, thanks for the answer. Thomas, will you take, yes. the, take the next one? Uh, again, another one for Benjamin from Alexander. Second question. Um, has the X-ray radiation of a higher power femto been evaluated and proper security measures taken? Well, the, it's not too much the, the power uh, because we integrated the femto technology since uh, uh, six years now. So the main uh, absolutely carefully and safety procedure to follow in lasers is the wavelength. Uh, so to answer to the question, yes, we answer to the safety reason, especially for the green laser. And uh, if need, I can send the specific uh, class one uh, protection we apply. Super, thank you very much, Benjamin. It seems there is an ongoing dialogue between um, Uh, GF Machining Solutions and Axis, which is also appreciated very much. Thank you, Alexander, for being, uh, for being part of it. Absolutely. Um, now, I just have uh, cancelled one question by mistake because we cancelled the question both at the same time. So we take another one then. Well, you got to forgive oh. us. We need to, de to <laughs> exercise have, a little we, bit we more. We have the very good and valid questions again. Um, Plat it, uh, why we, we change a little bit from, from Benjamin now to give him a break uh, to plat it. For plat it, congrats to the solid presentation. <coughs> what makes your system special, uh, really special, and what are the unique selling points? Okay, so thank you for your congrats. Well, what, what makes the system special and what, what we definitely took most care about in the development processes are two things. One is surface quality, because this is the most important for you, for your end product. And the other thing is the user friendliness of the machine, because usually when you work with PVD equipment, you need some expertise. There's a lot of things to take care about. And all this is not the case for the SM Pulse, as we reduced it really down to the essence, what we need to achieve with the perfect coding on your end product. For me, this is definitely a unique selling point because when, when you get this machine in house and start working with it, you, you instantaneously get familiar with it. And uh, yeah, for me, this is, these are the two most important points here. I feel that uh, your presentation uh, got uh, a lot of attention and not only that you, this is your first like presentation it. in the in the technical forum, um, that there are many, many questions on that. Uh, uh, 
And, and the other one, of course, uh, how many different elements can be used to apply more complex coatings that, that than chrome nitride? Uh, are you able to make processes on temperatures below 200 degrees? But I guess you have answered that question already before. On the uh, temperature. Yeah, so one word to the second sentence. Uh, yes, we can go below 200 degrees. Um, and to the first sentence, let's go back. Um, as I already mentioned, the machine is very simple and operates with one simple target. Of course, you can also introduce uh, co-alloy targets, and then you have different alloys in your coating. Thanks, Yuri. Dieter, I, I remember actually the one you have deleted. I think you wanted to have you wanted Christoph to be out of the game. <laughs> no, 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 not me. Uh, Christoph, <laughs> Christoph, I, I, I um, recognized what was asked, and the question was, how do you measure high relief? Okay, the relief is measured. Either the method is possible for both typical um, ways to measure um, the altitude of the relief. It can be focus variation if you go into detail and if you are very accurate in measuring, but this is slow. Um, and you can have the stripe projection if you want to measure fastly. Um, the point is if you have different um, edge shapes. Um, the most important and the most tricky thing is to have a reference layer. And this uh, reference layer is put onto the very top surface, so not depending upon uh, the edge. Um, this process can be used for all kind of um, edges, all shapes of edges, be it a blank or be it a coin. So is this a new way of measuring um, high reliefs? Has it specifically designed to do so? Or has this measurement procedure uh, been there earlier also for other good reasons? Yeah, both um, stripe projection um, as well as the focus variation um, are used since long. The point was um, so far there was no standard how to measure a relief and where to start measuring and how to evaluate it. So the interesting thing about our project has been um, to get a standard and how to measure a coin uh, repeatability um, always in the same way and get always the same results, one thing. The second thing is to evaluate the, um, the results that we um, received. And the third thing is then to interpret the um, numbers that we got um, whether it is a genuine coin, um, a good minted coin, a bad minted coin, whether it's a fit or unfit coin, or whether it's a counterfeited which has to go out of market. Okay, and Christopher, I have to add one more question is, how do you assure that your thought process of a high relief um, will not be melting away because everybody thinks that this kind of um, integration high relief into the market um, circulation coin industry uh, can be done at an attractive cost level as well yeah thank you for that question that is something um yeah everybody is asking um no the the um costs do not have to go up um for having a high relief if the minting process is done properly um, but the, it's not only the minting process, it's also a question of the blank, the right blank. And it's also a question of what Ingo was talking about. It's the preparation um, of the blank before um, striking. Um, then you have the coin design, you have the radius, you have the flanks. They have to be in a correct manner. And if you do all this in a good way, you can have high die lives and higher reliefs than you had before. We had one mint that had even higher, uh, they had higher reliefs and higher die lives at the end of um, those findings. Sounds like perfect world. Thank you very much, Christoph, for the detailed uh, answer. Vita, are you taking the Yuri, next we uh, have you on, uh, on stage again, on the virtual stage. Uh, again, congrats uh, from Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, uh, first of all. Um, Thank you for the presentation. And do you deposit chrome nitride coatings directly on the coining dies, or you may use this, a thin layer of chrome before a uh, chrome nitride layer? You can do actually both. 
That's not a problem. So the standard recipe comes without the pure chromium adhesion layer. But if you want or insist or your process requires that we can also deposit a chromium adhesion layer, that's no problem. Wonderful. So this um, uh, short answer is crying for the last question for you as well. Okay. Uh, again, jury for you. Um, it's a combined question. What would be the typical mm -hmm. layer thickness of the coating? And second, for the die size of 30 by 40 millimeter, how many dies can you coat um, introduced? Okay, let me answer the second question first, because that's, uh, that's very quick to answer. On this size, you have approximately 12 to 18 stamps in one batch. This depends also on the, on the upper section of your, of your stamp, as this is wider in diameter usually than the, the lower stamp side, which is engraved, but approximately 12 to 18. And to your first question, a typical layer thickness for a chromium nitride is in the order of two to three micrometers. If you work with a chromium nitride and a DLC, which is then a DLC2, which is then a combined process, you have approximately one and a half micron of chromium nitride topped with one and a half micron of uh, DLC2. If you work with a titanium diboride, then you are more in the order of one to 1.5 micrometers, but maximum three, not more. Yuri, thank you very much. I wished I would have understood 100%, but I think I need an extra lesson, extra course from yourself <laughs> directly to really um, involve and inhale what you have said. You, well, you're always welcome to visit us oh, in Switzerland, that, no problem. And, uh, Yuri, that will happen for sure. We will consider to come and do next time the preparation at your area in the wonderful okay. Switzerland. Yeah, looking forward to that. Super. Um, gentlemen, this is the time typically where Dieter goes um, off his chair um, on the stage and says, let's go for a coffee break. Um, that will not happen this time because the regulations are not allowing us to do so. Nevertheless, uh, it still means that we are finishing the first Q&A from the virtual session. And uh, this means that we can let you go in peace. And at the same time, I think Dieter and I would like to do this. Um, well done. Wonderful preparation. Not yeah. so easy. Um, to do what you did in this <laughs> short time uh, and put things together and I'm sure everybody, including ourselves, would do things maybe slightly differently, slightly optimized the next time, but we all will have a second chance for mm -hmm. sure in our life. For all the, for the reasons known to everybody, this is not possible. Nevertheless, we have them now live with us to be able to raise all the questions and have them answered by the experts. Will you raise the first question? Dieter? Yeah, well, welcome back, friends. Uh, hope you, you had a nice afternoon or whatever time zone you are <laughs> and you're doing well. Great to see you uh, all and do have you back on the virtual stage for the now following Q&A sessions. And as mentioned before, we had about 70 active uh, 70 active participants and um, uh, the number of questions uh, on the, on the Q&A is, is, is full loaded on, on, um, for a nice, nicely Q&A session we will have now. Um, Yuri, are you ready for the first one? This is uh, on top. How many different elements can be used to apply more complex coatings than uh, CRN or chrome nitride? Are you able to make processes on temperatures below 200 degrees? Celsius. Uh, thank you for the question. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Um, first of all, the S impulse is designed in a way that um, you have a single target in your chamber. This means that you cannot mix different alloying elements from different targets. However, you can work with a pure metal target or a pre alloy target. That's possible. And from that perspective, you have a relatively large variety of coatings available. As I said in my presentation, we start with a chromium nitride, which is a very basic but already very good coating. Um, but you can also think about our metals and metal compounds, mixtures of aluminum and chromium, or yeah, also purely ceramic targets like the titanium diboride. So there's a variety. And just to maybe add something to your question, if you want to have a different coating structure, again, you cannot use different uh, 
targets in one process, but you can, of course, always work with uh, a nitride and a metal layer and start stacking those. This can have very beneficial effects on your uh, tool life. Thanks, Yuri. And the second part of the question is about the temperatures, uh, the, the process temperatures below 200 degrees Celsius. Yes, that's not a problem. Um, usually we start with a heating process that takes us up to 240 degrees to degas your stems. But then during the process, we can go down to 180. Um, that's absolutely no problem. Wonderful. Thanks, Yuri. Are you taking the next one? I'm taking the next one. I'm mixing it up actually just to make sure that Yuri can start breathing again before the next question will be asked to him. <laughs> Patrick Grimmie from, from Weatley is also awake. Lovely Switzerland. Patrick, I, I know that you've been listening to the first session this morning as well. You will be double charged with double gin and tonic to Dieter and myself, but I'm reading the question to Christoph Frenz. Um, Christoph, for you. What is the typical range of relief applied on the circulation and precious metal coins? Is there any certain relation diameter versus thickness versus relief? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we face a huge difference in uh, the relief height. Um, it starts in very low cases with six micron and for circulation it goes up to 25 micron um, in Switzerland. So yeah, Switzerland is a, um, they manufacture presently the um, nicest reliefs. Um, with the diameter and the relationship um, this question can't be answered directly because it's always a question of how thick the material is and also which material is used. So this would be a matrix. Um, yeah, what would take a little bit longer to explain. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, Dieter, next question for you. Yes, um, Yuri, I, I guess you're, you're, you're back and prepared for the next questions which, which are coming for you. Brad Everton from the Royal Canadian Mint in Winnipeg, welcome to to this session and uh, to the question, and this is not a technical one. I'm not sure whether you want to take it or you just sent him a quotation uh, for you, uh, Yuri. What is the price of a machine? Um, this is actually something which I will skip because I'm not going to talk about <laughs> prices here in this session. We agreed on that here in-house. Um, however, if you have questions about that, feel free to contact us. Well, I, I can give you the, uh, the, the, the link to Brad and you can easily get in touch with him. Uh, Brad, yeah, thanks for that uh... one. But there's another one, a technical question for you, um, uh, Yuri. Uh, you have discussed the plasma etching stage during the PVD process. What is your pre-cleaning process to remove polishing compounds prior to PVD coating? <clears throat> okay, um, so before we put the coin stamp in the coating chamber, we have to remove any polishing paste, any any dirt and debris that came from any pre-processed steps. And this happens in an external machine. And basically we offer two solutions here. One is a solution with open baths, ultrasound, different fluids to remove different types of, of uh, uh, compounds. The other one is a closed solution where you basically take the coin stamp, put it in a special holder, put it in this machine and the entire cleaning or let's say rinsing and also drying process is done automatically in this closed system. Thanks, Yuri. Thanks, uh, Yuri. Thanks, yes. you, thanks. Yeah, uh, I will take the next one. The next one is actually coming from Torbjörn Hansen from Norway, who is also with us. Thank you very much, Torbjörn. Being part of it, you are always also appreciated on the mic when we were in Berlin. The question is to Platy, to Yuri. Yuri, what is your experience of coating laser frosted relief so you do not have the problem that the gold and silver don't or doesn't weld to the frosted relief? Well, we have we have run tests with different mints worldwide. Um, if we start coating different structures, we at least in all cases see a beneficial effect of the nitride coating on our uh, compared to a hard chrome. Um, and there's a good chance that if you work with a titanium diboride, this effect is extended even further. So, but there's for sure some more room to uh, look into performance of tools. 
if you're interested in running tests with us, let us know, and then uh, we can definitely try that. Makes sense, Jury. Confirming results or doubts is, I think, what we are, what we all are into. So thank you for that offer, Dieter. Ingo, are you ready for the next one? This is Absolutely. for you. The, the CHD material also considered for base metals circulation yes. plaques. Yes, is de it? definitely it is. Especially the chemical resistance is uh, suggesting this because typically in the um, circulation business you have strong oxides which you need to be pickled away with some robust chemicals. So from that point of view it is suitable and um, also because we we are now having alternatively to the balls, which are a bit too gentle from the geometry. Oops. We also have the satellites available, which I show now to you in the camera. That will will definitely be uh, the media of choice for circulation material because it has the same shape, and especially the rim of the the satellite is capable to clean out the rim area of the circulation blanks. So it's a definitely yes. Thanks, Ingo. Thomas? Sure. Yep. The next one is again for Christoph, Coinstitute. Christoph, are you using technology in coin validating systems for distinguishing between genuine and counterfeit coins? Yes. So the tests we have run um, have been on machinery, um, especially from, we tested different. We started with, with Zeiss, Wert, Alicona, we made, had good results with Alicona. And for circulation coins and um, stripe projection, so whenever it shall be fast, um, the tests were run on machines from Spalek um, with Induve software. Thank you, Christoph. Another one, Dieter. This is now for uh, GF Solutions. Uh, the, um, Thank you, a great learning session. Uh, the comment was here from uh, Steve, uh, Steve Chi. Looks like it's Steve Gregory here. Yeah? We think so. <laughs> from, from the Royal Mint, so welcome, Steve. Uh, this is coin die orientated, but are you able to directly cut precious metals, particularly aluminum or uh, um, AOU, please? Uh, so th uh, thanks in advance for the answer. Uh, sorry, I did not understand really the question. Uh, you mean cutting? No, the, the question was, this is a coin die orientated, but are you able to directly cut precious metals, uh, particularly? Good question. Um, I, I would say we have uh, different technologies in our portfolio. We Honestly, I don't have direct experience, to be honest. So. Technically, if I think about the material and the request, should be possible. But I didn't have any direct experience at the moment. So I could pre I prefer to answer transparently so that the customer should come back to us in case of. Or could be another trial case for you. I'll give you the context of Steve and will you keep in touch with him to answer that one. Absolutely. Perhaps in Absolutely. a later Thank presentation the in the technical anyway. forum. Yeah, of course. Thomas. Yeah. Thank you very much. The next question is for Yuri again. An 18 tool capacity seems small compared to other systems. Is there any benefit of smaller batches? Um, yes, there is a benefit of smaller batches because in, in the smaller chamber, it's, for you, it's easier to maintain and keep clean and, and maintenance and cleanliness of, of the machine is key for having perfect surfaces. Secondly, Remember that the batch times in this machine are relatively short. Uh, usually in standard PVD processes, we have batch times in the order of six to eight hours. And in this machine, it's only four, so it's approximately half. So from that perspective, your productivity is still quite good. Okay, so you, are you saying smaller batches are um, resulting in more precise coating results? If you look at the loading of the tool, I would say yes, because the the orientation of a coin stamp in this machine is so precise. Every stamp sees the same surface of the target, and hence your coating is the same over the entire diameter. You have no variation over the stamp surfaces, and that's a big benefit in terms of precision of the stamp. Understood. Thanks, Yuri. 
Christoph, uh, for you, a question from, from Robert, from Rob. Um, why was the decision to go from the top of the relief rather than the surface plane? Usually heights would be taken from plane zero. This is uh, what Robert is interested in. Yes, to be honest, we started from zero. We uh, started from the ground of the um, coin, um, but we found um, that there is no rep uh, repeatability. Um, that was not so accurate as uh, when going from top um, to the to the lower. So when measuring the relief, we need a reference layer, and this reference layer um, we have put on top of the edge, um, and whatever the shape at the edge is, um, you can put in a layer. And if you go down from this layer, um, you will have, if you measure on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the days, you will have the same results. And this is something that we wanted to achieve to have a repeatability and that we can evaluate precisely um, and always with the same um, evaluation um, coins. So that is possible better with the reference layer uh, from top downwards. Thanks, Christoph. Thomas, are you taking the one from Italy? Yes, Paolo Mascioli. Thank you, Paolo, for being part of this um, session, session B of the first session. Um, Paolo is from the Italian Mint and has a question for Platit. In case of a chrome nickel decoding, are you sure we won't have an, any hexavalent chromium at all? I am very sure that you have hexavalent chromium when you're decoding chromium nitride. But and that's the major advantage if you compare it to any uh, hard plating processes. Uh, the amounts are very small because here in, in the PVD process and also in the decoding process, you're not dealing with large amounts of chemicals. We are talking here about um, low quantities in, in, in the lower liter regime compared to tens or even hundreds of liters for hard plating process. So yes, you have hexavalent chromium, but in very small amounts and our decoding solutions are built in a safe way that you are not getting in contact with any uh, evaporized media. Thanks, Yuri. Paolo, I hope this will answer your question. Dita will raise the next one. Ingo, uh, you have some business opportunities at the Royal Canadian Mint, it looks like. The next question for you, can you comment on the wear of CHD media? Do you have a rough estimate on how much longer would you expect the CHD to last compared to the 316LSS? You have the answer, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, Dieter. The, um, there is a combination. Wear is, is a function of mechanical wear and chemical wear. So we have um, data from from the field where uh, CHD media, the, the ceramic bowls, are used in precious metal production in a 60 liter bowl for more than a year. And we could not measure, or we, the, the only where we could measure was less than 0 0.1 millimeter in that uh, way, uh, one year of in production. If you compare this from the mechanical uh, point of view, um, that, that might be similar to the um, uh, stainless steel, but the, the chemical attack is the, um, the, um, the vulnerable spot of the, the stainless steel. If you use strong chemicals like, like we just saw in the study, you will solve the chrome and nickel, which are part of the alloy, and uh, this will, will end up in, in wear of the surface, like we saw in the pictures, and finally also will end up in the wastewater. And if you are uh, using the wastewater and send it to the public drain, chromium is a very sensitive parameter. So from that point of view, um, that's another benefit for the, for, the, uh, for the ceramic, because first, there is no chromium in the material composition. And secondly, as a consequence out of this, you will not emit any chromium ions into the wastewater. Thanks, Ingo, for, for that one. Yeah. Take you, are you taking the next one? Yes, from Benjamin, Joburn is hitting you with another question. Joburn Hansen from Norway. Um, Benjamin, you're talking about the production of commemorative dyes. How about the production of master dyes for hobbing circulation, circulating dyes? 
Um, so I will say, uh, so yeah, it's uh, a good question. Uh, we have uh, done some experience. Um, it's interesting to share maybe some results separately, but um, for sure our laser and our machine could achieve an uh, excellent result on such application. Yeah. Um, are you saying, Benjamin, um, you, are, you are able to um, laser finish the dice prior to hobbing? I think that was the question. Is that correct? Yes. Correct, okay. correct. We did uh, for, uh, you know, we are in Swiss and we did uh, some tests on different markets, especially for the watch industry, and uh, it works properly. So I do not know exactly the request uh, coming from uh, from uh, our potential customer, but we did some nice, absolutely nice result for watch industry. Thank you very much for the explanation, Benjamin. <coughs> Benjamin, no way for you to go to the relax mode. Another question for you from <laughs> Shen Yao Li from the Royal Canadian Mint. Uh, up for, would you please compare PicoSec and FemtoSec lasers in terms of processing time, heating, affected zone, etc.? Well, you don't have another 12 minutes to answer that question, but uh, could you give a brief response to Shen Yao, please? Yes, absolutely. So briefly, I can answer that the femto is totally without burr. So it's a cold. It's called the cold laser in terms of uh, approach. So the big difference you could achieve, especially on some material, is that the engraving or the the, the job you will do with the femto is totally free of burr. So this is the main difference. Then in terms of power, for sure, the 20 watt um, Femto, yeah, Femto Flexipulse offer a wide uh, range of parameters you can select. And as you know, a Femto can work with a nano parameter and pico parameter. That is not possible with a pico second laser. Thanks, Benjamin. Thomas, are you taking the next one yep. for Christoph? Christoph, I think this question is also um, about, sorry, this, this is changing. Uh, Ah, yeah, yes. Now I, I can see the question. Christoph, are you comparing any data to the original CAD design? I think this is uh, um, referring to which me measurement. Okay, um, I didn't get the question fully. If I, if I understand right, um, comparing to the original CAD data, um, in design-wise, uh, we changed the curvatures and the flanks. And we also changed their design to bring the relief up. Does this match the question? Um, Christoph, we don't know exactly because this is Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, but maybe um, uh, the person who has raised the question can uh, go a little bit more in detail or contact you directly. I'm sure that is also uh, preferred from yourself. Yeah. Dieter. Shen Yao has been pushed forward. Uh, he has a lot of friends in the minting community. And this is another question for Ingo. Uh, Ingo, have you done any cost or benefit analysis of using ceramic media? Thanks in advance for the question, <laughs> for, the, yeah. for the question, for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, this is done by our customers. And um, <laughs> the it's always price and um, benefit or let's say return on investment. This is what it is. Um, because of the nature of the high performance ceramic, the, the, the price for the stuff is, is, is on an, on a higher level, but this is the, uh, uh, the payback, what it's, it's, it's counting afterwards. And like we said, the, the performance on, on, the, on the, the blank surface itself, the durability, and I stress it once one more time, the chemical resistance is giving that trade off and um, justifying the usage as kind of an investment rather than being a consumable. Perfect, thanks Ingo. Thanks Ingo. We have another one from Kyle Simpson, also from the Royal Canadian Mint, Ingo. Is there any yes. concern with the trace CHD media contamination on precious metal blanks or coins? Yeah, because we couldn't detect the wear. Um, but on the other hand, there is always a little bit of wear particles. There's in, in the technology, there's no nowhere. Um, but the level what we what we could, could detect so far was below the, the measurement um, traceability. Belgiums. So from that point of view, we had no um, negative observations. 
Thank you, Ingo. I, I would also confirm that when, when the studies were carried out, and we have quite a number of uh, people being interested in this media, um, we can say, Ingo, if you agree with what I'm, what I'm saying, that the, that the result and the research was done to find anything on the surface as a leftover uh, on a blank, like also little particles, which is sometimes left over from the stainless steel media. That has not been confirmed. Is that correct, Ingo? This, this is correct. We did uh, microscope analysis of all the surfaces. And so <clears throat> on that level, 200 times um, um, microscope uh, magnitude, we could not find any um, visible things, what, what, what you sometimes see uh, with, with stainless when, when, when uh, chops of material or flakes from material are falling off the stainless because of the, the wear and tear of the surface that has not been um, uh, observed neither on the blank or on any media because this is the the, the negative basically of the um, of the particle you find on uh, potentially on the blank thanks for the question kyle thanks for the answer angle christoph ready for the next one when you look at uh, height reliefs with uh, straight edges do you see that more complex relief designs are possible with high relief over the low reliefs? Yes, they are, um, it's a good question. Um, the, point is, the point is that in the past years, um, little plated steel coins um, were yeah, worldwide um, win winning field. And with the hard surface of nickel, the quality and the relief um, of the, the coins went down. And it is possible to have this in, in, in two different um, or even in three um, different um, altitudes um, because of, let me say, a complete change or improvement of the production process. So to achieve the higher relief, um, we started with the blank, with, the, with annealing, um, and we went on with the curvatures and the designs and um, also by um, yeah, what Ingo was, was, was saying, we were thinking of how to improve um, the polishing of the dies to reduce the friction on the surface. And by that, we could enlarge uh, the reliefs. And yes, it is possible to have that in different um, altitudes. Thanks, Christoph. Thomas? Benjamin. As a green laser has a narrower beam than the red one, it seems suitable for minting engravings. Why do you think it is better, the red one, for the engraving steel? So honestly, for engraving steel, uh, the best one is the uh, infrared laser, because you could achieve a wide range of parameters. The power compared to the slice remove <laughs> will be better and efficient in terms of quality and the speed. The green is really, really interesting on fragile material. So especially for glass, sapphire, diamond, uh, other kind of material. So I will suggest for engraving steel, the Femto infrared 50, 40 watt will improve the speed, achieve a good quality on steel, not green necessary. Thank you, Benjamin. Christoph, looks like there will be a great friendship between Chirpe and Hansen and yourself with the next questions uh, which are on the table of, uh, for you. Uh, you mentioned high relief on circulation coins. Do you mean only a sharp contour of the design or to the table or do you mean a really high relief? Uh, a really high relief. Um, the high relief makes, makes the difference. Um, and we have seen from the, uh, if the coin shall last long, it is important that we, we called it a security area from the edge to the first part of the um, relief that has to be especially high. So it's not only the question of, of the flooring, it's um, the question of the complete hay in relationship also to the um, rimmed edge. Thanks, Christoph, for that reply. And there's another one. Do you, are you taking that? I will. Torbjörn again. <clears throat> Example of a high relief in Norwegian 10 kroner from 1983. Diameter 24 mm is 0.55 mm. Are you considering this as a high relief as well? Yes. Yes. 
this is something um, today we no longer see a release like this. I very much um, like this and appreciate this because um, if you look at that coin, it looks very valuable and it looks worth something. The higher the relief is, you can make some, some, some testings. The higher the relief is, the more it looks to be something worthy. And I think um, in our times, I think inflation will come after the uh, COVID situation. Um, inflation will come and then it is important to give the people the feeling our coins are valuable and that can be done with coins like you had in Norway. That was a very nice, nice one. Thank you, Christoph. Benjamin, you're back on the floor again. Uh, are, you, are the shown samples produced with a green laser? And is this one of the one of the reasons why the process to, uh, by, by the process took so long? Um, it, I will say this question can give me the opportunity to explain a little bit. So uh, our GF Femtoflexible laser had uh, the possibility to switch from one wavelength to the second. Uh, the switch of these uh, two inf uh, wavelengths uh, is less than two seconds. So uh, I will say the example we share with you during this event was only to explain the capability of our laser system to achieve different material, but especially looking only on the details and the quality. The time, uh, in some cases, we did some uh, very com nice combination of, uh, I will say, engraving between green and red, and the time compared to what we show with uh, to you could be cut on tree by tree easily. But for sure, you should find a compromise between the quality and the details reproduction you want to achieve. Let's say that the target of this uh, session with uh, you was to put in advance the quality. So if you compare the RA on the surface and the detailed reproduction, this was the main topic we would like to put in advance. Another time. Thanks, Benjamin. For Spalik, the next For Spalik, I will take this one from an unknown person, Ingo. Yes. Is there any difference in weight per liter from ceramic compared to stainless steel media? Yes. It is it's about 20% lighter. Stainless steel media typically has a weight of 5 kilogram per liter. Um, ceramic high definition has 4 kilogram per liter, 20% less. This is especially uh, beneficial if you want to reduce, or let's say if you don't want to have a, such an intensive orange peel, what you sometimes get from the stainless steel media, you just can swap to the CHD and with the same parameters, because of less weight, you get less orange peel. If you, do, if you only have the stainless steel, you have to mix, typically people softening the, the, the satellites with balls. This is no longer uh, necessary. You can directly swap to the alternative material. Thanks, Ingo. Okay. Thanks, Ingo. And uh, thanks to Aurelio for the uh, compliments and all your feedback is highly appreciated. Uh, and please, Go on and, and continue giving us uh, um, your valued feedback for, for the next sessions. So thanks to Aurelio and also for the other comment on that. Coming back to the questions for Spalek now uh, from Turpern. One more uh, from the my from Turpern's my 30 years experience. This media have made the blank finishing to a new level. Uh, the surface um, is a lot better for production of all qualities. So that looks, it's not a question, this is a statement. Huh? It's a wonderful statement. Thank you, yeah. Torbjörn, yeah. and uh, looking forward to see you again to give you a beer. <laughs> 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 looks like it, Ingo, thank you very much. Um, I, I take the, I don't take the comment, I just take the question. Ingo, it's another one for you, if you're ready to answer yes. that. What do you mean yes. by height scratches? Would you please compare ceramic pins and satellites? Which ones are, are better for what kind of material? Blanks question mark. Pins? Um, okay, uh, yes. Okay, no. The um, height scratches, if you have micro scratches on the surface, um, polishing is basically cold forming of, of the, the microscope layer of the uh, of the blank. If you have a deep scratch, maybe less uh, deeper than 0.2 millimeter, 
there's no media in the world to hide that, to heal that little scratch. But if you have micro scratches, maybe from transportation or from um, blanks laying on each other, the, the media and the, the weight of the media is forming a new surface while rolling on the surface or, or, or applying pressure on the surface. There is more, pl more pressure if you have more edges, basically the um, the rim of a satellite or the rim of a pin will some kind of uh, apply the corner, will apply the edge will, will apply more pressure, punct, uh, point pressure on the surface rather than a bowl. So if you have micro uh, scratches, um, media with edges are capable because of that higher pressure at the point to 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 eliminate them. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I think so, Ingo. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm just reading the two comments, which are not questions anymore from, from Patrick and Steve. Uh, Patrick, Steve, thank you very much for the positive attitude you are taking into the panel, onto the screen. Uh, that's really a support we are very thankful about. Um, this will conclude the Q&A. Um, Christoph, Benjamin, Jury, Ingo, thank you very much for the second time participation today. The questions were not less, there were even more. This is the time for you to go and have whatever you would like at the, at the time of the day. Thank you very much for being part of it. I, I would love to say that let's go to a get together, so, but we have to postpone that for, for, for a little bit time. And, and these are actually very entertaining, again, again, entertaining 90 minutes for, for all of us. A very new experience for a virtual technical for, uh, forum session. And we are very happy that you joined us actively. Your valued feedback is always welcome. You are, of course, invited to participate also in, uh, in, in the following sessions. Uh, the next one will be in March. Yeah. Thanks. Um, if you, dear audience, if you found the presentations interesting, if you, if you would like to see them again for doubts or for, for confirming or whether you have missed a part of them, why don't you go on the World Money Fair website and look at the YouTube channel uh, to see them again if you want so, with yourself or maybe also your colleagues. This is also the right time to um, say thank you to Brandstorm who has really made it possible uh, to be here in this studio to do the streaming and to have the technical background, which just worked perfectly. That definitely is also worth uh, a round of, a, uh, of applause, which we have done on stage typically. Um, at the same time, we have to thank the headquarters in Berlin to be the, 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 the head organizers of the technical forum. If you like this and you would like to follow the next uh, sessions, which are two, three, and four. The next session will be held on 25th of March. Um, we will again do it at 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And the presenters will be the Royal Canadian Mint, Artasen, Inner Code, and Tika Print as a co combination. And we would be happy to see you at that session again with the same and to the other. Yes, and you're very welcome to, to join us. And if you did like, uh, this session, please tell us, uh, tell your industry associates about it. Uh, free of charge registration on the website is possible at any time. Your valued feedback is highly appreciated. Please give us your feedback and your comments, uh, also possible on the website. And we are happy to welcome additional auditors uh, during the coming sessions in March, April, and in May. Um, most of the time you will meet us on the last Thursday of the month, uh, usually the day for the technical forum. And uh, I, I, I'm sure, uh, Thomas, after the experience of the, the first session, we, we really can't wait to talk to um, our friends at Addison and Royal Canadian Mint and Innocode and Techaprint uh, for their presentations and for their contribution. And we will be happy to support and looking forward to welcome you again on the March 25th. Time to say goodbye. Thank you very much for being part of it. Thanks, thanks a lot and goodbye. Take we care. We are having a gin and tonic now. <laughs> and keep social distance. <laughs> <laughs>